Correct. May I invite uh, the next two speakers, and they're the last two before Mr. Dhol is going to give his summing up, uh, the, the very well-known and distinguished Mr. J.K. Dutt, uh, an IPS officer with a great deal of experience, most uh, well-known across India for uh, being in charge of the 2611 operations in Mumbai, uh, where he was then heading uh, the, um, the NSG as Director General, the Black Cat Commandos. He's then been also DG CRPF, has been Commissioner BCAS, and uh, he has been in various capacities as a police officer, recipient of many awards, including the Police Medal for Gallantry, Police Medal for Meritorious Service, sir, and I'm quite interested to see that you're also a Mayor College JTM Gibson Award winner, so I assume you're an alumnus of the school like me. Please come on to the stage, sir. Mr. J.K. Dutt, and uh, cyber security expert, uh, Mr. Bhattacharji. Uh, Subhimal Bhattacharji is the head of General Dynamics in India, and uh, uh, extremely, extremely informed uh, expert on cyber security, a subject which was very much in the news. Uh, in the last couple of days, uh, Subhimal has been part of an intergovernmental panel, uh, is a mathematics postgraduate from Delhi University, and uh, the General Dynamics, very big American company, the head in India, and also represents a number of other uh, power and other initiatives from American companies. So I leave now the floor to two very distinguished speakers. Mr. Dutt, please, sir. So what we'll do, Subhimal, do you have a PowerPoint? Yeah. Okay, just Subhimal, start and I'll just get it loaded. Yeah, just Anil? Is Anil here? I think I can. What what I can say? I have to think about this. Uh, Good afternoon, Mr. Dahl, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. Everything is moving very fast. It's like playing a 33 RPM at 78. So I'm going to take a bird's eye view of the presentation which I have prepared specially for this IPPAI. First of all, I consider it an honor and a privilege to be given this opportunity to address the members in this August assembly. The presentation, the ideas which I give over here are entirely my own. They do not represent any policy of the government or any department or non-governmental agency. It is based entirely on my readings, on my experience of 38 years in the service and dealing with different situations. The topic which I was given is the problems of inner circle cities, ghettos becoming breeding ground for terrorists. My presentation is going to be in three parts. The first one is on this subject here itself. The second one is going to be on a request which I received some days before I came to this IPPI retreat and that was to share my lessons which emerged from the Mumbai incident with all of you. And the third, if we have the time, and if you would like it, I would like to play a composition by uh, Gulzar, the lyricist, and sung by Shankar Mahadevan. That's a very short it's a little song. I'll bring out the significance of it as I proceed with this presentation. The facts and figures which I have mentioned in my presentation, they are from, some of them are from the report of the Committee on Slum Statistics or Census. And 
the topics the topic for this presentation is uh, really very relevant both for the present as well as for the future we have ghettos which contain the seed for giving birth nurturing to terrorists not to say anything of criminals and other organized crime which one may find in these places in these ghettos you will find the people tend to become almost a law unto themselves and there is hardly any interference with the way of life here are some statistics about the census which was conducted in 1981 the census in 2001 and the number of people who are staying the slum dwellers in mumbai and delhi one thing i would like to make very clear at this stage itself is is not that the people love to live in slums it is only that these slums develop because the people don't have anywhere else to go there are many reasons for it and we'll go over it shortly you must be very familiar with this film the slum dog millionaires and many of you must have definitely seen it this is the photograph taken of a poster which was in new york in 2009 it showed us the ugly side of the slums in india and of course the country was presented in a very poor light but i would like to say here that the government has come up with schemes such as the rajiv awas yojana and the swarna janti shahari rozgar yojana there is much more which is required to be done than just these yojanas and we have to see that as long as these slums exist we as in a humanistic approach are able to ensure that they get some civic amenities education health care and problems which our uh, slums get rise to what is a slum would anyone like to attempt an answer to that well here is the definition of a slum by the united nations a slum in is an area that combines to various extents the following characteristics in india we have uh, every state in our country has its own definition of a slum and slums in india are declared and non declared but it does not mean that a declared slum starts getting amenities open on its own it remains a slum but there are certain other things which get attached to a declared slum and a non slum where the government is concerned the united nation has enumerated this characteristics because they serve as a yardstick as what they will be able to achieve significantly by 2020 to be able to improve the condition of the slum dwellers it does not talk about prevention of slums that these will not take birth slums will continue they will keep coming up till some political determination is shown and some other qualities as well so what are slums actually they serve as a vote bank where you find that the cluster of slum dwellers they enjoy a political patronage and they serve as a vote bank then you have a lopsided development ignoring issues which are involved the development becomes uncontrolled and unplanned because of rural migration to the urban areas you have unemployment and poverty are some of the factors which are conducive to criminal activities these offer easy avenues for recruitment of criminals not to say of terrorists the encroachment becomes a nuisance for legal property owners and the urban planning requires a vision the planners they need to have a vision for inclusive growth which takes care of slums and the problems we need manpower requirement and this can be met with proper planning for lo locating and accommodating the people who are involved how early that begins will also decide on how fast to what extent a slum spreads 
we have talked about the security threat that will come up again and again and there is a lack of will where slums are concerned. We need political determination to ensure that we are able to make the life of our core citizens, I would say, easier and better. Nobody deserves to live in a slum. In fact, it has also become a money-making uh, system. Mm -hmm. In fact, I have learned from very uh, money-making system in the sense that, you see, when the elections are around, you will find that some dwelling units come up. These are occupied by either shopkeepers or you will find that person, it becomes a habitation and it develops into a slum. And slowly, after the elections are over, this becomes well-established, well-grounded, and it goes on expanding. And nobody dares to interfere with it, least of all the police. In fact, I am told that in Dharbi, which is our, one of the largest slums areas, I am told that if somebody goes into the heart of Dharbi, you will find that there are all sorts of illegal activities taking place. So much so that you will even find slot machines, gambling dens, and what have you. What is the reality today where slums are concerned? It is not uncommon to find that the persons who are staying in the slums, they have voter ID cards, they have PAN cards, they have ration cards, and they are able to avail these facilities. And how do they get it? Well, I think you all have the answer. Some are paying a cost, a fixed cost towards electricity and water. Even in authorized colonies, it becomes very difficult to get electricity and water by the time you complete the formalities. But in slums, you find it's comparatively easier. How? Again, the reason is the same. The selling and purchase of units is quite rampant, as there is a feeling of security that this slum is not going to disappear without giving something in return. And that what normally happens is the government goes in for a low-cost housing and flats are allotted and people are asked to vacate the slum and move into that area. That, of course, has its own problem. You have real estate developers who pay lakhs to certain slum dwellers to clear the area without approaching the police or the courts. Now, that is another problem which we face and there has to be another solution to that. And most tier one and two Indian cities are facing a serious social issue because of slums. Why do we say social issues? You find that in social issues, there is a contrasting lifestyle. As I said, people don't go willingly into slums, but there is a contrasting lifestyle. And as a result of that, you find a person's social status in our country is determined by his postal address. Now, if you have somebody who in a slum has been living over there, the type image of that person is he's not going to be easily traceable, he's a troublemaker, he's unreliable, and he's a shirker. Now, these are type characteristics which put an individual, especially in a slum, to a social disadvantage. So, a slum is regarded and looked upon as a lawless area. Now, a slum dweller thus becomes a very easy prey and gets involved in criminal activities and views crime as an easy money-earning means. He thinks that by earning this money, he will be able to get some respectability and move out of that slum, little realizing that the circle of crime doesn't ever allow him to leave. Now, some of the difficulties which we have, you know, the NSG conducts anti-hijacking anti exercises during peace times with different types of aeroplanes. And I remember that we used to conduct these exercises at Mumbai Airport, Santa Cruz. And that area has so many slums. You can see the picture over here, the one which is below over there, encircled in the red thing. And they can, you see, these, these are, Exercises are supposed to be tactical and strategic, and they're supposed to be confidential. We don't, but these special forces do not share their tactics and strategies with others, because the very purpose of it otherwise would be lost. But what happens over here is, 
You can have a sniper, you can have an observer, you can have a person with a mobile phone, and anything which is happening at an airport can easily be passed on to the terrorists. I think in the event of a hijacking in our country, and if the plane has to be forced landed, it should not be forced landed at Mumbai airport. It also has a serious risk to the manpower problem. You have the Central Industrial Security Force, which has to increase its force tremendously, maybe tenfold. They have to be able to ensure that there is no infiltration taking place. And yet you find, in spite of all the security arrangements, these infiltrations do take place. People do get in, and it's not, it has not been easy or possible so far to remove these encroachments. You have the Mumbai local trains. There are some areas in which the slums are there on other side of the railway track. And the difference between the wall of the slum building and the train is hardly one meter. The train has to slow down tremendously so that people do not get killed. We find that the railways have not been able to keep that area 10 meters free on either side. And this affects thousands and thousands of, of commuters, office goers, who may be delayed. There may be persons, illegal activities taking place, getting in, getting off the train, planting, easier to plant your IEDs. And we've had these explosions, blasts in these trains as well. The clearing the slum is also a big problem. You find, you know, there's a trauma for the displaced persons. They are uprooted from where they are. They have to move to distant and violent places. There are political and community, communal motives behind any slum clearance. These, when they happen, you find different reasons being attributed to the removal. You have the bribery element, which is what I was referring to, which all of you are quite aware of. And then you have legal stay orders, which prolong the agony of everyone an eyesore, a health problem, and the conditions and lifestyle of the people. The police action, that has to be taken sometime. It creates problems, it results in injuries, the medical services have to be called into play, and of course, the unpopularity of the security force. What is the solution? There is not one solution. There's one solution which I would suggest over here, is community policing. Community policing is done through your consultation with the persons who are involved. They are the persons I have found who are the best able to give the solutions. I have found right from my, in my career, I have always even involved constables, the lowest rank in the police force, to come up with ideas because they are the ones who are actually performing the duties. They are the ones who are patrolling. They are the ones who are conducting raids. They are the ones who have to fight terrorists and others. You ask them and they give beautiful solutions. Solutions maybe that some of our officers even are not able to think of. So do not think that just because this person is a constable, he cannot have good ideas. Now, having said that, as I said, we have to come to this, the Mumbai incident. And right from 26th, the incident in Mumbai has started. 27th to 29th, I was in Mumbai. I had taken my commanders in a special plane. And in that NSG operation, we were able to rescue over 600 hostages and neutralize eight terrorists. There were two at Oberoi, uh, two, four, uh, uh, four at Taj, two at Oberoi, and two at Nariman House. Now, nobody until then had thought that terrorists could siege a hotel and have hostages. Nobody could have ever thought earlier that a plane would be crashed into a building and there was no, no, nobody to negotiate any demands, make any demands or ask for anything. And yet, this is the first time it happened. And when this happened in Mumbai, it was a game changer. We need to collaborate with strategic partners to neutralize threats emanating from abroad. In fact, we have been trying to uh, get the draw the attention of the world to this problem, and but it was only after the World Trade Center that at least the USA showed interest and took some active steps. The law order or law and order is a state subject. The result is that when this Mumbai incident occurred, 
it is not that the central government or the NSG could come on its own. We had to wait for the requisition to come from the state government. And when it came, that is the only time when the force was able to go. Now, one thing which I have been talking about, which I think a problem which we all face, and that I think in our country is the problem of attitude. We may have any number of training exercises, we may have any number of officers, we may fill up the vacancies, we may have the facilities and everything, but if the attitude is not correct, I'm sorry to say that I don't think we are going to make much of a progress. I'll give you an instance from this incident with Chakrat. You see, I saw I was watching TV and my daughter came, not I was reading a book and my daughter came in and says, uh, Papa, there is a shooting going on in Mumbai. And I said, oh, you know, film shootings keep taking place, the news chats must be covering it live. He says, no, no, persons are getting killed. And within the first five minutes of the shooting, the, some of the live shots which the channels showed, I was sure it was a terrorist attack and not a gang for. I immediately rang up my officers in the NSG and I told them, get ready, we'll have to move to Mumbai. I think it's only a matter of time. Somebody else would have thought, let the order come, then we will move them. But the order was, I had not received any order, I had not spoken to anyone, and yet the force was ready and it had started moving to the airport. We had started arranging for the uh, aircraft as well. We finally got the order to move to Mumbai at 0150 hours. The, once this order came, there was a race against time. There had to be quick decisions which had to be taken, and there was a changing scenario which was taking place. There were very limited inputs for the force to work upon. Of course, when we reached uh, Mumbai, we got all cooperation from the local police authorities. These lessons which we learned, which emerged subsequently, was you know duties, responsibilities, tactics, and strategies. These change with times, and we must be prepared to keep up with them. Nothing holds good for all. There have to be availability of plans and outfits, especially where a law and order force is concerned, whether it is in a riot case, whether it is in a disaster management thing. One has to, these maps and things are being prepared now, and these are available. We need to also have a national networked data bank where criminals, terrorists are concerned from where information can be accessed quickly. We should remember that intelligence doesn't predict the future. It should make us think about the future. I believe that intelligence is the primary line of defense for us. In fact, it is, it's, the intelligence should be the first responder, much more than the first responder on land. Because it is only when the intelligence comes in correctly and accurately, somebody had asked, can the number of terrorists involved, the place, the time, anything can be predicted. Maybe it can be predicted, but the number of information which come in, one really doesn't know which one to take seriously and which not to, to what extent one should prepare for it or not. The result is, again, attitude. You have to leave nothing to chance. Another thing is, you see, when we talk about intelligence, too many warnings also tend to threat, to blunt to the threat of uh, any such uh, warnings. So that is also something which we need. In fact, I think in our country, very few persons would be knowing what is a red alert, what is an orange alert, and probably this differs from place to place. The NSG regional hubs which have come up, in fact, uh, I became DGNSG in August 2006, and by the end of the year, the proposal for creating four hubs had already gone to the government, to the Home Ministry. Why I did it? Because I felt that Delhi used to become fog-bound in December, January. And if an incident occurred at that time, it would uh, be very difficult for the NST to move. This thing was then taken up after I had returned from Mumbai. I briefed the Home Minister, Mr. Chitamram, had taken over, and I mentioned him to that there was already a proposal for this. And then this was followed up. I think that is one of the reasons why we were able to set up these hubs within a period of six months, because even during my tenure, the land had been uh, examined and uh, identified, more or less. We purchase procedures have to be quick. 
you'll be surprised or shocked to hear that the NSG was trying to get ladders for their anti-hijacking for over 17, 18 years. They were working with ladders. These have now been obtained just, I think, a year or two ago. But these ladders were being repaired and had been left behind by the German security forces. And this is what we were using. But all the time we brought in for tenders, the specification has slightly changed. So we had to go in for retendering. Uh, the requisition of an aircraft by the DGNSG till then could only be done in an anti-hijacking situation, not in a terrorist attack. And, but there is a lot of misconception that there was delay in getting the aircraft. The aircraft was available in Delhi, but it had to be refueled. The crew had to be caught together. From now, from then onward, there's always a plane 24 hours round the clock available at Delhi airport for moving the special forces. We have, we must have uh, mock drills, drills and training. We have talked about any amount. And we need a hotline to our police stations from certain big industrial places as well. The one of the fallouts of this incident has been the popularity of your security gadgets. Now, whether it is a mall, a hospital, a cinema hall, a hotel, any conference place, you find there is security arrangement. And this is something which we should not take lightly, because the threat of terrorism is here to stay, at least for a decade or more, two, three decades, perhaps. I'm just finishing now. Huh? Uh, we need trained negotiators for hostage situation. We have not been able to use negotiators anywhere, except for some of these uh, incidents which have happened in the Red Corridor, uh, one or two. But we need trained negotiators. We don't have that. Then you find that the security paradigm should not be premised on the threat of IEDs alone. In fact, that is what had been happening before the Mumbai incident. Before the Mumbai terrorist attack, we had explosions in Hyderabad, Bangalore, Gujarat, Delhi, Calcutta, I think, Mumbai. So everyone, the security forces were tuned more towards dealing with explosives rather than with terrorists. And now, of course, we also have suicide bombers. This is something we should, should be prepared for, for detecting them and for neutralizing them. The future scene, NBC terrorism, cyber terrorism, terrorism on the high seas, which seems to be looming, sets the days of Blackbeard, the pirate, I don't think, are yet over. Finally, our law enforcement agencies and politicians should be prepared to handle the fast changes that are occurring in our country now. I hope they live up to that. George Santana said that those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Let's hope that doesn't happen. Another lesson, finally, the lesson that emerged goes to reinforce one's belief that in times of an attack, the country does come together. And we found that this is what happened at the time of the Mumbai attack as well. The Mumbai terrorist attack was definitely such an incident. In fact, as Mr. Suhail Seth had said yesterday, you know, there are, we need things which stoke nationalism. And this sentiment or feeling of togetherness was followed up by me as DG NSG. And uh, the result was an NSG song. This Mr. Gulzar had kindly agreed to compose the lyrics on the basis of the material which we were able to furnish to him. And on the basis of uh, all that material, he made out a song. I started it. it my successor got the thing and had it released in October 2009. I had retired in February 2009. So if I have your permission, it will just take three or four minutes. Would you like to hear it? It is, it is a song, ladies and gentlemen, which is for every one of us and all Indians. We'll do it later, if you like. As you like. Uh, okay. It, will, it promotes optimism and confidence. I don't think anyone else here would have heard it earlier, and you will do so shortly, if you like. Thank you. A personal retreat in this retreat. And my retreat is, originally I thought I'll present you slides, but I was very lazy and I backed off. But let me talk to you on a subject which uh, is not on the retreat. It's always on the forward move, uh, which is uh, cybersecurity. My original topic was cybersecurity for the grid. I might go a little bit more into an overall critical infrastructure protection. Uh, I was lucky to hear uh, Mr. 
Floria as well as uh, Mr. Solanki this morning uh, laying a little bit uh, on where we are on that. And uh, Mr. Gopal Pillai also referred to uh, cybersecurity where it stands. Uh, nevertheless, uh, all of you know that it's something on the move. It's, uh, you know, a fight between who is moving faster, the hackers or the people who are misusing the net or uh, the law enforcement and possibly the technical community there who are enabling this uh, uh, march. Uh, most importantly and most interestingly, uh, in the last two days of July, uh, you had these two uh, incidents of power tripping and uh, the media attention and, of course, the disturbances that uh, a lot of people faced in the streets uh, at home. Uh, so there's been, a, I would say, something of a, or of a kind of a situation and awareness that all of you felt that this is a scenario that can happen. Uh, and very interestingly, Mr. Pillai had referred to the IDSA uh, report which came out on the 16th of May this year. There was a task force which looked into cybersecurity. And despite being preponderantly fed with uh, you know, government or retired officials too, they came out with a report on scenario building. And the first uh, chapter was primarily uh, touching upon if there was the crippling in the airport, if the power system went off. So they tried to position a scenario that this is possible when a, a cyber attack comes on some critical or, 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 or a specific critical infrastructure. Here in the last two days, it has been an education for me. I understand much less of uh, the power sector. Uh, I still uh, keep an eye and watch on the, you know, the developments of the renewable energy field. But some of the points that I picked up, uh, the gaps that we have, the demand and supply gap, the march towards uh, technology, the enablement and more usage of, say, digital switching compared to the analog switching, and the stages in which more and more IT is imbibing, whether you look at the generation, whether you look in the distribution and even to the last mile uh, where you and I are uh, possibly getting uh, smarter meters. So the grid uh, or the system of grid is getting smarter. Uh, and definitely, we are carrying with this, this particular uh, smartness uh, hardware vulnerabilities, software vulnerabilities, and of course, the human vulnerabilities. Uh, in most of the cybersecurity reports that come out uh, globally from uh, people who have put sensors and are managing it, uh, many of the think tanks have also got into this area, but uh, someone like uh, Symantec, which gets out every six months a uh, very good report with some few thousands of sensors spread across the world. Uh, while the hardware vulnerability is there and while you are still working to get into addressing the software vulnerability despite you know, all the zero day attacks that we call them, the human dimension of uh, security never goes away. Anytime anything that's happening, there has to be or possibly in most of the cases you would see an insider element also happening. So are we also addressing that? Uh, someone referred to the Chinese uh, hardware also that is coming in now. If you follow what the government is doing on the telecom sector in the country, some norms and rules are already being put in place to verify those equipments or uh, you know, use a sanitized team to look at those equipments. How much of that is happening on the power sector? I don't think you know, really much is happening. In fact, a lot of Chinese equipments are coming and there is a fear uh, around that. You know, there, there might be some bugs hidden here and there you know, which possibly might uh, lead up to some Trojans and then possible vulnerabilities. On the software front, <clears throat> two years back, uh, you saw the Stuxnet attack, uh, a particular virus or, or a very high-end virus or a worm which actually went and attacked the program logic controllers into industrial systems. Now, this could be also any affected, primarily the cement system, targeted in Iran. But don't think, you know, India wasn't also affected. India was also affected, uh, as well as Indonesia. Uh, some more viruses are, you know, on and off now being thrown out. 
which are much more sophisticated in nature and these are definitely targets that look at critical infrastructures and all. So we are at a point of time that we cannot ignore it. It's not the IT manager or the CIO's domain right now. It's an overall board and management decision about where your IT security systems uh, fall into your overall uh, network protection systems as a part of your overall uh, critical infrastructure protection. Just for the physical assets that you are guarding, how much of an IT is getting intertwined into that physical uh, security, the uh, telecom security, everything. It's, it's something of an integrated control room kind of a system where you also have the cyber element locked in. Uh, I, I don't think you know most of our organizations are away from that. All of them are sensitively looking at uh, these aspects and addressing them. But remember, more and more uh, long doers are also coming. More and more motivated people are also coming into to look at uh, trying to not only pick up your vulnerabilities but also actually to launch uh, dedicated attacks. So you always have to be on the guard. As a nation, uh, you know. We, we heard a lot of uh, discourse in the last two days. Very, some of them are really very inspiring, you know, and many times we also feel where we are heading. But we have not possibly stayed away from uh, being dynamically conscious to what should be uh, cybersecurity or uh, critical infrastructure protection as a nation we should have. Uh, we had the IT Act, the Information Technology Act 2000, way back in the year 2000. It went through a parliamentary standing committee. Let's not debate the wisdom and intelligence of our uh, parliamentarians at that point of time, but they put it in place. In 2008, uh, we actually passed or, or the amended that act. Of course, it was done in a hurry after the Mumbai attack, but before that, a very quality work went into you know the, the re revised procedures. Former police commissioner of uh, Delhi, Mr. Nikhil Kumar, and later a member of parliament, he was the standing committee chairman. I have seen him go to every nook and corner and every uh, vested interest groups you know, related to that, whether it's the trade bodies, the companies, or users, and define a very, I would say, robust uh, policy or, 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 or a revised act which we got. Now, in that, for the first time, we define something called cyber terrorism. Now, everywhere, you know, it's the kind of a misnomer also in some places. What actually it means? Does it actually mean, you know, taking uh, some codes and uh, throwing a hospital system or a power system out of the way? Or it, does it, you know, it look at a little bit some kind of attacks which have much more intensity into, say, critical sectors? So we defined uh, cyber terrorism under Section 66F. We also uh, qualitatively defined uh, protected systems in Section 70, which we had uh, originally done in the Act of uh, 2000. And further, we also introduced another 70A, which we said there would be a dedicated agency for the protection of critical infrastructure protection. Now, many nations for a long time have publicly defined what are, what constitutes a critical infrastructure protection. So, you know, very well-known areas like, say, airports or uh, telecom systems, power systems, all of them are almost common, you know, water systems, etc. We publicly possibly haven't defined and thrown it to the public, okay, these seven uh, things are our critical infrastructures, but within the functioning of the government is very well defined, you know, as CISF or intelligence or everyone, they have a very qualitative definition what constitutes, and so that's the place where this act the Information Technology Act has put provisions about an agency would be responsible for the protection of critical infrastructure. And for that matter, it is the <coughs> National uh, Technical Research Organization, NTRO, uh, under the Prime Minister's office that is mandated to do that job. Now, it's just not an institution that possibly with a mandate can only do it here. A lot of public-private cooperation uh, has to happen. How much of this fostering is happening, happening with an act in place, how much we are able to involve uh, sanitized individuals or institutions to really look at uh, the vulnerabilities or, or the conflicts in uh, cyberspace to address that. So I'm sure you know these are some of the plays which we will have to look at. Unfortunately, in this country, every, everything uh, was always a reaction. So 
you know, anything massive happened after that, you suddenly try to show you are building up a big uh, uh, effort to look at that sector. I think this is a play that has to happen all the time. Mr. Pillai referred a lot on the training aspect. Uh, this is so critical. You know, how do you uh, constantly evolve uh, a kind of a, or inculcate a sense of understanding of that sector, the dynamism of the sector? Is it something, you know, you feel that only with your law enforcement agencies and their uh, uh, people who have been recruited over the years, they can really go and become uh, some uh, cyber experts? Or how do you build a national pool of uh, sanitized uh, individuals and institutions who can get into this area and uh, support the efforts of the government and law enforcement? Uh, so there's a lot uh, happening. Uh, I like Mr. Dutt's... Uh, one of the points uh, where he made towards the end, that intelligence cannot predict the future, but can definitely uh, make you look at the future. So same possibly applies in cyberspace. You, you can think that you know, this possibly this is what it is. Even I like the other slide of Mr. Uh, Solanki, very short, possibly is it next, the Taj Mahal, which is going to have. So everyone is the negative elements in cyberspace, they're looking for new opportunities and new ways or unique ways to attack you. So you have to be always on your guard. Uh, I think the critical information infrastructure policy has to evolve much more closely. It's a play between industry and government much more uh, effectively. Uh, we should have many of this kind of uh, you know, forums and uh, I would say events where the level of understanding is raised much, much higher. Uh, when you saw the two-day grid failures, that possibly generated a lot of awareness. But after that, of course, around that time, a lot of people thought whether cyber was the motive of that attack. But definitely, you know, as it's coming out, it's not. But definitely, you cannot ignore that, you know, cyber is also going to be one of the key vulnerabilities that could trigger uh, such kind of an attack. Uh, I don't think I should go any further before your lunch. Uh, I think uh, it's, it's a learning curve for all of us. So possibly when all of us again meet next time, we'll have some more uh, wisdom and understanding about how we look at this critical infrastructure protection and also the grids in place. Thank you so much. So well, thank you very much for being so considerate. Uh, I'm under huge pressure from speakers who still uh, who made presentations and have had to. Mr. Mehra, sir, would you be kind enough to enlighten us for about five, seven minutes? I know that's a tall order for you because uh, you've all obviously put together a very detailed presentation, but say about five, seven minutes so that we can stay with time. The program's been uh, telescoped considerably. Yeah, General overview. 15 minutes, otherwise no point speaking. Yeah. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. You heard the order which has been given to me. It's as tall as the gentleman who gave it. But I'm sure I'm not able to, I will not be able to comply with that order because uh, it's a bit too tall. Uh, but uh, having said that, uh, I'll just uh, make a couple of points on my perception of how terrorism is going to evolve in the urban uh, in the urban uh, environment and uh, this is a perception which may not be entirely correct but it does empirically sort of uh, borrow from what has happened around us um, and then when Maruf tells me to stop I'll stop so it's going to be a bit staccato it's going to be a bit uh, uh, bullet point oriented um, urban violence in general and urban terrorism are not new phenomenons, we all know that. Yet over the last decade, I'm talking about since around 2000, the threat of urban terrorism looms larger than ever before from New York to Moscow from 2001 to 2011. We have seen the ugly face of an evolving urban terrorism. We have experienced it in, in India in 2006, uh, in the commuter bombings in Mumbai, and then one, once again in 2008 when we had 2611, on which my colleague Mr. Dutt has spoken so eloquently. Um, 
terror attacks in urban areas are today not merely attacks. These are terror assaults. And I want to distinguish between an attack and an assault. An assault is almost a military action. But in this case, it is being perpetrated, perpetrated against a civilian unarmed population. And that is what 2611 was. Now, these attacks have a strategic objective. It's no longer a tactical objective. They are not part of an insurgency campaign and a byproduct of the larger ob objectives of the insurgency. These are actually strategic objectives to hit you in your economic underbelly, in your places of economic activity. They are also intended to chase pol uh, change policy, as you recall. The Madrid bombings in 2004 altered the entire outlook of the Spanish government on the war, on uh, on the war so called war on terror in Afghanistan. And the next government, which was elected, in 2004 withdrew from Afghanistan because of this attack. So this is the kind of objectives modern terrorism has. The unique uh, aspect of the new urban terror is the use of multiple dimensions for attack, either simultaneously or individually. These are land, sea, air, and perhaps the day is not far off when they could all be used in conjunction along with cyberspace and a C CBRN uh, situation as well. The Mumbai attacks, I'll skip the 1993 attack in Mumbai. I'll just come to the 2008 attack, um, um, which in fact has come to be recognized as a template in modern urban ter terrorism. It has certain extremely distinctive features just like the 9-11 attack that went before it. Just me let, let, uh, touch briefly on the 9-11 attack. This was the use as an aircraft as a missile template. It, is, it was absolutely without precedent in terms of innovation, in terms of sophistication, in terms of the destruction that it caused. But it had a precursor. It had a precursor in the aborted Algerian hijacking six years before from the Algiers International Airport to Paris, which was detected by a good intelligence action, and the terrorists negated by the G GSG, the, uh, the French uh, uh, commando teams, before they could hit the Eiffel Tower. So there is that precedent. So no attack is entirely new. Only the nuances of its execution and the, the degree of destruction and the employment of force change. Now the Mumbai template is unprecedented in terms of the upgrade in, aircraft, in trade craft, in terrorist trade craft. Whether it was reconnaissance or planning, which started as early as two, 2007, commando style training, combined with a suicidal mission, seaborne landing, augmented firepower, use of technology, and a melange of armed assaults and tactics. Carjackings, IEDs, barricades, hostage taking, all intended with one objective. And that we had seen before, and that was to penetrate the designated targets and to hold out till either you could not kill anymore because of the exhaust exhaustion of the munitions that you had on you, or you could escape, the latter being a remote possibility. So that is why these are not called suicide attacks. These are called suicidal commando attacks. But they had a precedent. The precedent is something with which I am familiar, having been in the CRPF earlier. This evolved in Kashmir by the Lashkar-e-Taiba between 1999 and 2002, when they perpetrated as many as 55 suicidal and suicide fidayan attacks on security forces in Kashmir, most in Srinagar. So this was the assault tactics, and it was combined in conceptually with another plot, which was an Al-Qaeda plot of 1993. It's called the New York Landmarks plot. It was very, very similar to Mumbai. The only distinction is that 1993 did not happen because of the intervention of the US intelligence services. 1993 was successful. 1990, uh, 2008 was successful. 2008 was the 1993 plot, the New York landmarks plot, combined with the LET tactics 
fabricated in, in uh, Jammu and Kashmir and then inflicted upon a hapless civilian population in Mumbai. And since 2008, I observed that there is a new template being developed, and that I call the Mumbai Plus template. I'm not saying that it's going to happen, but the possibilities are there. And this is being perfected in, in, uh, the, in, in our near um, neighborhood, that is in Afghanistan, particularly in Kabul since 2008. In April, we had the Mumbai Plus template repeated in Kabul with with uh, not so devastating an, an attack because you have rings of security around Kabul uh, that is of NATO. Kabul is well, pro uh, well protected even from the intelligence angle. But look at the upgradation that, that happened here, both in terms of uh, the weaponry that was used and in terms of numbers that were employed. There were nearly 40 uh, assault teams, 40 terrorists involved in this thing. They attacked eight targets and held the city to ransom for nearly 18 hours, as against Mumbai for 60 hours. Of course, the damage caused was nowhere near Mumbai because hard fighting had taught the NATO how to counter the Mumbai assault. I tell you, the NATO in faraway Afghanistan, the, uh, the New York police in uh, New York are, are actually rehearsing the Mumbai template the Mumbai Plus template, which we don't appear to be doing here in India as much as we should be doing. Now, if the dynamo of events post-2014 in Afghanistan, and I can't explain this further because of the paucity of time, are a repeat of what happened post-1989, when Zia hoist, foisted on us the proxy war in GNK, if that were to happen again, please expect the worst and more urban assaults. Now, what has the Mumbai Plus template or the Kabul template shown? It has shown that relying on central forces ex exclusively or special forces designated by the center to protect myriad cities and targets is just not going to work. It is precisely the trap that has been designed by the new template to create a protracted standoff. Now, can you imagine multiple attacks, cluster attacks in three or four cities at the same time outside the uh, NSG hubs uh, where deception and tactical advantage belong to the terrorists. They hold themselves up deep inside a target and then take you on for the next 50, 60 hours before the NSG arrives. Now, who's going to interdict them before that? It has to be the local police. So my case has always been that it is the local police which ultimately must deliver. And it must deliver at the Thana level. If it even has, whether it has to be being the first responders in this case to at least localize the attack, create drag dragnets, create command posts, not allow the thing to spread, etc. It has to be the local police. I feel that the chief ministers have to be responsible for, for this aspect, and they have to be held accountable for it. Now, it does require a lot. My friend has spoken about all that is deficient in the police, from training to weaponry to equipment to technology to police ratios versus population, police budgets, which are abysmal. Police depends on central handouts in, in the nature of uh, uh, modernization programs to sort of modernize. Why should the state police be entirely dependent on central grants? Why can't it work up a budget of its own? Mr. Chidambaram had emphasized this. So what you require are also command and control centers which can actually adjust and ad adapt to a rapidly changing environment, which is going to be the environment of an urban assault. Now, broadly speaking, these are the things that we would uh, need to have. I'm not discounting the use of uh, national forces. They will come, but it's only after the local police has done its job and minimized death and destruction. Of course, intelligence will always be the first line of defense. Strategic intelligence provide by, provided by the central agencies has to be turned into operational local intelligence. Having been in the, in the, in the, in the intelligence services for years, I've, rec I've learned the fact that it, this does not happen. And this needs to happen 
from the grassroots level upwards. The information cannot always come top downwards. And I think our solutions also need to be bottom upwards and not top downwards. I think we are creating a very heavy, heavy central uh, response team and ignoring the grassroots level activity which is required to counter such attacks. So this is briefly what I have to say on urban terror. I hope the prognostication is not right. I had something to say on ghettoization and the fact that ghettoization is not and does not breed terrorists in entirety. It's not the whole story. It's only part of the story. And it's part of a larger story. Most of our attacks, most of our insurgencies have been predominantly rural. The maximum damage that we have had is from rural insurgencies and terrorism like the Maoist and the Northeast insurgencies. Cities will always be focuses of attack for various reasons, uh, which because of the paucity of time, I cannot, say, uh, uh, cannot cite right now, but ghettos are only part of the problem. And what is required is the spark that lights the kind of mindset that may be created in certain environments, which lends itself to easy exploitation. I had tried to list out the recruiting bases of certain uh, major terrorist organizations which have actually attacked our urban centers. And I find that the recruitment from ghettos on whatever material is available is as little or as much as the recruitment from elsewhere across the countryside. And what is that spark? Just let me give you a quick example and then Maruf, I end. Let us talk about the concept of so-called jihad. Uh, I uh, disclaim any, any, um, any um, uh, religious connotation to what I'm going to say. It's not, there's going to be no religious con connotation. The so-called jihad, the so-called jihad, the first jihad began in Afghanistan. It was engineered by Jia, by Zia, supported by the Americans and others particularly Saudis. Then it turned into the Kashmir Jihad and became a regional issue. And thereafter, when a lot of international jihadis concentrated in the AFPAC area to fight the Soviets, you had people like Abdullah Azam, a Palestinian coming from, uh, 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 from, uh, from the uh, Middle East who transformed this idea along with al-Zwahiri and others through their own writings. And we had the birth of global jihad, a more pan-Islamic response to, to the concept of uh, fighting the, both the near enemy and the far enemy. Thank you very much. I'll conclude with that.